Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are in the world. My name is Jason Levine, aka Beetlejace. Very nice to see you here on the Adobe Twitch channel. So today is Audio 101 Part 18. Uh, and as the title suggests, it's all about terminology and tips and things that you should know if you're going to be doing any kind of, uh, any kind of audio. Technically, this is episode 20, and um, I'm sorry to say, <laughs> this will be the last Audio 101 of the series. So I figured uh, 18 was a good number to go out on, officially numbered 18. And uh, this will not only sort of be a review of everything we've done, we'll get to play some things and talk about other stuff, but um, truly I'm going to go through A to Z terms that, if you're going to be doing audio and if you followed this series thus far, these are things that you should know, and these are things that when you're thinking about working in audio that you may remember, and they'll spark, you know, the idea of how to, how to do them, how to perform them, how to get better. So, without further ado, since we have now 55 minutes approximately to get through A to Z of audio, let's go to my amazing list and see where we're going to begin. The letter A. <laughs> Which, of course, the first thing that you should think about outside of audio itself with the letter A is amplitude. Okay, now as I've showcased to you many times in audition here, lots of different ways to affect amplitude on your on your audio files. Okay, if you go up to the effects menu, amplitude and compression, you'll see that we actually have an amplify effect, which is really no different than this little heads up display that you see here. Now again, this will be different in other NLEs, but amplify basically to adjust the volume, adjust the decibels. Uh, of your audio files directly on canvas here, in this case inside the waveform editor. So I never really use this amplify effect because we have this on clip amplitude adjustment right here. And you can visually see how it's affecting the waveform. So again, amplitude allows you to adjust, effectively think of it as the volume of your individual audio files. You will of course do this in the context of a larger mix. You'll do this on individual files. Sometimes you treat individual files in the waveform editor here. A is for amplitude, A is also for lots of other things, but that's the first thing you should think about. And actually, it's one of the last things you think about too, amplitude and loudness, and we'll get there a little bit later. So, A for amplitude, lots of different ways to apply and affect amplitude, and also to analyze amplitude. A for analysis as well. Uh, my favorite panel in Audition specifically, Amplitude Statistics, okay? If you don't have it already docked, you can see it here. You scan your audio files, and this thing tells you everything you need to know about your audio, peak amplitude, true peak as it relates to loudness units, sample values, clipped samples, DC offset, and there's even more if we scroll down. So A for amplitude, super important, something that you'll always think about when you're working on audio files. Okay, the letter B. Now you see I've got bass, instrument, and frequency range. So of course, yes, we're B for bass guitar, uh, or acoustic bass, or upright acoustic bass, bass fiddle. Um, and if we go into our multi-track here for a second, we've been working on lots of different, um, lots of different songs, lots of different tracks over the course over the last few weeks. And bass, of course, can be an actual played bass, like I said, a bass guitar. So this is uh, from this is the actual multi-track of my song "Retouch Me," available now on Spotify. And if you take a listen here, we can just solo up the bass, and you can actually hear the bass guitar by itself in this mix. Increase our master a little bit here. Kind of nice, thumpy and dirty. That's a Rickenbacker 4003. Now, while I'm playing that, of course, the bass guitar also relates to bass frequencies. And as we discussed in the Equalization Audio 101s, when we're talking about bass frequencies, and if here, if I could just go ahead and make this bigger for a second, we're really talking about frequencies sort of below, you know, it, 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 it encompasses more than 200 hertz and below, but really, this kind of low frequencies below around 200 hertz. A lot of your fundamentals of your bass guitar and bass instruments are going to be in the 60, 70, 80, 100 hertz range. And as you play this back, and you can see we're in logarithmic mode here. You can see that all the energy of that bass... 
you're hearing the, the bleed of the background vocals there on the uh, reverb bus, um, you're seeing a lot of those fundamentals again in this sort of 180, 90 hertz range. So bass frequencies, bass range, um, this is where you would equalize in those specific ranges for bass guitar. Now remember, things like bass, though, also have a lot of mid and upper mid presence sometimes too, depending upon how they were recorded, much like this bass. It's kind of distorted, and I'm adding a little distortion effect on there. And uh, to bring out more of the string noise, more of the neck noise, then you're going to want to apply equalization to things like 900 hertz, 1.1k, 3k, a lot of that string sliding around, which some people don't like. I actually really dig it. I've, I, I like to feel, I like to feel as I'm sliding into notes. So um, you're going to find that in kind of 3k, 4k, depending upon, again, the age of the strings, how it was recorded, what type of mic was recording off the amp. Um, B for bass. C for clipping and compressor. Now, all of these, by the way, you could have multiple letters for. Some I just added a few, some uh, some are one or two. So clipping and compressor. Well, first, clipping. Clipping is essential because this is something that you need to be aware of when you're working with digital audio. Now, you saw when I raised the master fader here, this was solely to make it louder for the stream. Um, I don't have any sort of master compression or limiting or brick wall limiting on the output here. So I just increase the overall volume of the uh, entire mix of the entire session. When I was doing that, though, let me go ahead and kill these. Uh, kill those. OK, I'm actually playing quite quite tame right now. OK, there we go. So we got some some clipping lights going on here. By the way, that's all downstroked. I never downstroke, but I did it for the style of the song. Um, downstroking, very popular in punk bass playing, by the way. So when you ever, when you see these red lights appear on your level meters, this is telling you that you have digitally clipped. Now, when we're working with audio in the digital domain, we're working in what's known as a negative logarithmic scale, meaning that zero, zero is the loudest you can get. And minus, if we're working in 24-bit, for example, minus 140 dB is the quietest you can get. Or in the case of what you often see, negative infinity at the bottom of your level meters. So zero is hot, minus 140, uh, cold. <laughs> Start to think of an opposite of hot. Um, silence. So loudness, silence. So when you go above zero digitally, those little red indicators are telling you clip, clipped sample. You've now clipped digitally some of the samples. And remember, since we're in 48K, we're recording at 48,000 samples per second. I don't know if you can see that there. Yeah, there we go. Um, some of those samples above zero have been clipped. Now, digitally, when you clip a sample, you're technically destroying it. Um, these days, we're a lot more forgiving of a couple clipped samples. And because we're no longer really worried about pressing to a physical medium, i.e. CD. We can, we can get away with some clipped samples when we're talking about compressed audio files like AAC, the kinds of things that you get from iTunes, MP3s, the standard delivery format for audio files. That doesn't mean that you want to be clipping while you're recording or even while you're mixing. So clipping basically just refers to being aware of those red clip indicators on all of your tracks, especially the master. Now, of course, with compression, we're talking about using an actual audio compressor, which you've seen me do we, uh, lesson eight here, Audio 101, how to use an audio compressor limiter. In Audition, much like all of your popular DAWs, digital audio workstations, you'll find multiple variations of compression. Here is one of our tube modeled compressors. Here is uh, um, our Dynamics processor, which is also a combination compressor limiter. We've also got a lot of, you've seen me use many of my uh, preferred VST plugins. This is one of my favorites of all time, the SSL 2Mix compressor. And this is to allow you to control dynamics, to actually control, and in some cases, minimize the dynamic range to make something a bit more even, right? To make vocals punch, to make music punch or pop through everything else. So we use compression for a number of different ways to control dynamics, but it can also be used as an effect. And you can find more about compression in Audio 101. Lesson 8, available here on Twitch or on my YouTube channel, youtube.com slash Jason Levine video. D, D for delay, and de -esser. So again, delay and de -essing. Now let me see if I can go to, uh, do I have any delays used on here? I was going to try and bring up something. If not, we can just apply one. We're just going to do this on one. 
Delay-based effects. So we've got some triplets, we've got some doubles here, delay-based effects, very commonly used for background vocals, for guitars, for, for anything, for snare drums. Um, we've got a whole lesson on using delay-based effects, and you can use them too. I don't even know why I was bothering to, to showcase it to you. Duh. I don't know. I've done it a million times anyway. So D for delay. D also for de -esser. Now I don't happen to have on this session anything that requires sibilance or uh, D uh, removing sibilance, but you can find those under amplitude compression, de -esser. And the de -esser is for just that. If you have recorded voice, recorded sound that has emphasized s sounds, you can use the de -esser to soften or to attenuate the S, okay? Now this can be done um, specifically just with equalization as well. We talk about this in some of the EQ lessons here at Audio 101. And you're usually going to find some of those really intense center frequencies of the sibilance around somewhere between 5600 and 6300 hertz. Fortunately, we've got a de or effect in here. We've got a couple of different presets for both female and male voices. I always tend to kind of uh, modify these anyway because male and female, that doesn't really mean anything. And you know, any, you can have an extremely low voice and still have a lot of sibilance. So I don't really conform to this idea that male-female de is necessary. It's just really finding that specific frequency specific to the voice, right? Much like the wand choosing the wizard, the microphone choosing the voiceover artist, the sibilance, it's always going to be kind of in the same range. But again, it'll, it'll vary uh, via, you know, a few hundred hertz to the right or left of a particular center frequency to give you the best result. And you can use the de or here, or you can also do this via EQ, as I mentioned, attenuating somewhere with a center frequency starting around 55, 5600 hertz to around 6300 hertz. E for equalization, which we've already been talking about. So yes, and you notice uh, if Finch is here, yes, I used the English spelling, <laughs> which is actually how I usually do it. I don't particularly care for a Z right there. Equalization, EQ, this is the way that you carve out space and customize the sound uh, for all of the elements of your mix. And in a mix like this one here, you know, we've got a lot of music going on, right? So we've got a lot of things playing at the same time, and you got to make space for them. So here, if we just go back and play a little bit of this. Fly from my expression, retouch me, they want to see. Electric piano. Okay. Some weird sounds happening here. One of the uh, one of the drum kits. Here we go. There's another one. All right, and you've got to carve space for each one of these. So again, a lot of these you're going to see. If I didn't use the on the on track EQ. They've got some kind of equalization either via an effect or if we go back to the mixer here so you can see all of these tracks here. These are all using the on track EQ, um, attenuating some lower mids here, boosting some highs. Again, here's some very narrow bandwidth attenuations going on. We've got some bass roll off here. Is this on our this is on our reverb? Yeah, so we're kind of eliminating all of the. Uh, all the bass frequencies here via a high pass filter. So equalization is what allows us to really customize the sound to remove things, right? If you have a ring from a snare drum or something that's too bassy or a hum, or perhaps you have just some very high end noise that you don't need, you can equalize those out. And of course there's lots of different equalizers and you'll see them in the A to Z list here. And there's also different f ways to equalize. I just mentioned high pass filtering allows high frequency to pass through, cuts low frequency. Similarly, a low pass is the opposite of that. Low frequencies pass through, high, high frequencies are cut. So you have high pass, low pass, shelving filters, parametric graphic, and we'll get to all of these. F for flange, a version of modulation type effects, and FFT which is an EQ, also known as Fast Fourier Transform. Okay, so F for flange is a modulation effect. 
And I think this can really be nicely illustrated. Probably hear this with some, uh, here, let's go into one of these um, acoustic guitars. Probably hear it nicely on here. You will find this under effects modulation flanger. And to give you an idea of what it sounds like, here, let's take a listen here and just audition this one, which is called Hate Ashbury. Again, very appropriate, seeing as this was kind of a 60s thing. You hear it all the time still, but here's a little taste of what it sounds like. Nice. So no flange. With flange, here we go. hear that? And I can add more feedback to make it a little more intense. Okay, so flanging commonly used in mixing all the time on vocals, on guitars, even on bass, on drums, often used as a transition effect. Sometimes, you know, you hear it even in dance music now, right, where you have kind of some very heavy beat, right, and then you have that which is actually, um, it's actually uh, uh, either a combination of low pass, high pass filtering, but oftentimes there's also a flange in there, which is used as some kind of transitional thing to kind of, you know, click into some other movement in the song. So F for flange, F also for FFT, and just to show you here the FFT filter, FFT standing for Fast Fourier Transform. This is really a very simple, very basic boost cut type filter where you can zero in on specific frequencies and boost or cut them um, with very fine-tuned adjustments um, very quickly with very narrow FFT sizes. Um, to do sort of clinical things, this is also a great filter in Audition to remove things like mic rumble, um, subharmonics. You can see we've got the LP de-emphasis curve here. Lots of different options to use equalization, and the FFT filter is one of those. And this really, I, I go to this for like simple roll-offs, cut-offs, removing things like popping P's and plosives, which we'll come back to in just a moment. G for gain, guitar, and graphic EQ. Gain is really something that you're going to apply uh, to your signal before input, right? Before it actually comes into the audio application here. So when we're in multi-track, I often talk about gain staging and people ask me all the time, they're going into their sound card and they're saying, yeah, it's, the signal isn't hot enough. How do I adjust the gain in the software? Well, you're not adjusting the gain here because this is just capturing whatever is coming in through that sound device. So the gain has to really be gain staged. It has to be adjusted properly either, either on your preamp your mixer or your sound device that allows you to adjust the input level. So to think about gain as your input level. Now, once you've actually recorded that sound, yes, then there is a post-record gain adjustment, which is effectively adjusting the amplitude, right? You're not going to any longer control that signal to noise ratio because the sound as it was recorded at the input has already been captured. So whatever that relationship is, noise and signal, it will remain, you're just, adjusting, you're just increasing or attenuating by a specified amount. So gain is very important to set properly at the input stage as you're recording. And of course, guitar, we were just listening to acoustic guitar there. So G for guitars, very commonly encountered in audio recording. Okay, H for hard limiter, hiss, and hum. Again, you'll find many of these letters have multiple terms that would apply. These are three that are very important. So the hard limiter. Hard limiter, quite simply, is uh, something you will need or can use to effectively create a digital ceiling. Remember moments ago I was um, adjusting the master so that you could hear everything a bit more uh, so that it was louder on stream. Well, we can actually increase amplitude without worrying about peak limiting or peak or clipping by using a hard limiter or a digital ceiling or brick wall limiter. They're all the same term for the same thing. So here in Audition, if we went to Amplitude Compression Hard Limiter, I could set the maximum amplitude, which for this, let's say I wanted the maximum amplitude to be minus one dB. You then have the ability to add some boost to this, which means you're going to increase the amplitude of everything feeding this hard limiter, but it will never go above the maximum amplitude, which is minus one. So again, a hard limiter is basically a digital ceiling. Remember that we're working in this negative logarithmic scale where zero is as hot as you can get. 
So you don't want to go right up to zero. You want to be a few tenths of a dB or at least a decibel below. So in this case, I've set it to minus one. We can continue to add input and it's never going to go above that ceiling. And to showcase that, let's go ahead and play this back and take a listen and see what it does. I've got a loop section. So again, we can drop the input, all right? But if we increase it, okay, you can see that it never goes above. It never clips, right? So if you want to prevent clipping on your master with everything feeding it, you can add a hard limiter. And typically, if you're going to use this, but you're not necessarily mastering, you just want this to kind of, again, increase amplitude just a little. Um, often I'll just set the ceiling and no boost because then it's not going to sort of adversely affect the dynamics of everything going into it. Once you start adding input boost, now you're using this as a limiter as well. So you're going to start squashing those dynamics down so that everything is definitely more in your face. Um, again, we've talked about this in the mastering lesson. I've talked about this many times. I don't generally recommend putting a limiter on the master fader because if you're going to master your files, you should really do that separately, clear-headed outside of the multi-track. But this is one way that you can do it and you can apply that with a hard limiter. Okay, uh, hiss and hum. Now these two sort of go together. You can tackle and fix, but you also need to be aware of where it is. So if we go into our spectral frequency display for just a moment here, now very fortunately I recorded this, this is from one of my episodes, we don't see any hum here, although it does look like I had something resonating around 100 hertz. I can't really hear what that is. Just in a moment, yeah, you can kind of see it down here. Just a little something, but just for a second, and then it went away, I wonder what that was. Um, but ultimately, hum generally refers to 50 or 60 cycle, this you're going to get simply by plugging something into a wall. If you don't have finely treated electricity in your home or studio, you can often, and sometimes even if you're plugging in a guitar or bass, not uncommon to have some kind of 50 or 60 cycle hum. This would be represented by an actual a line. It's very linear looking inside the spectral frequency display. And you'll see it with its center frequency around 50 or 60 hertz. And then you'll often see all of the subsequent harmonics. You can identify hum here in the spectral frequency display. Similarly with hiss, hiss generally refers to tape, analog sources, and you'll see hiss resonating above the 10K range. That will not be linear. That's just going to be basically blocks of color that are gonna be some kind of gradient variation in the case of this spectral display of sort of purple, reddish, orange. Remember that here, color is amplitude. The closer the color is to yellow or white, the louder the amplitude, the closer it is to black, the quieter the amplitude, and then all this, the, the gradients in between are different levels of amplitude. This was recorded digitally in a very quiet environment, so there's virtually no hiss, it wasn't an analog signal anyway, but there just isn't even any noise. There's no wind, there's no air conditioning, no nothing. I mean, those can be considered versions of hiss too. None of that here, but this is where you would find it, and we do have effects under noise reduction, to control both hum and hiss with the D hummer uh -huh, and hiss reduction. On to I. Now this one, this is a random, this is a rando. I couldn't, <laughs> off the top of my head, I was like, uh, I, uh, oh, infected mushroom. It's one of my favorite new VST plugins. It's also a very inexpensive plugin. Um, this is something which I'd known about for a long, long time. And it just, it just gives a really, well, there's lots of different variations of sound. What is an infected mushroom? I don't really know. But uh, the idea is that you can you can definitely create some very cool sounds with this. It's probably sound pretty nice on a drum kit. So why don't I go ahead and solo these drums? Looks like we've got some reverb on there right now. Ooh, a lot of reverb. Okay. Let's take a listen to what this sounds like. Let's go into our mastering I am pusher. Now you can see this particular preset is called Punchy Master. I've, it's pulling up the last version of this, so I've modified this. Infected Mushroom Pusher. Okay, so this is just a, a, an effect that gives you 
yes, it can create some very cool, loud distortion type effects. Um, you can see here drums, smasher. Here, let's see, I'm gonna turn this down a little bit just so that I don't blow my own ears out here what this sounds like. Not as aggressive as I thought it would sound, actually. Vulgar drums. Infected Mushroom. <laughs> this is such a cool plugin, and uh, it's one of my recent favorites. You can use this on anything. You can use it on individual tracks. You can actually see here I've even got some applied on the master. This was something that I actually did um, kind of finish in the multi-track. This was audio for video. So I wasn't doing a separate master. I was doing a direct export, and I took that opportunity to use that option there. Um, but this is just a great sounding plugin. It's VST. It can be used in any DAW. It can be used in Premiere Pro. Just a great way to give a little color, a little, a little, um, little color and flavor to your audio tracks. And as I've said many, many times, um, what really sets apart your mixes, or what makes your mixes stand out, or what makes sounds in your mix stand out, is using different effects and different processes on each track. Nothing wrong with using the same EQ or the same compressor across everything, but then everything's going to have a very similar characteristic, and that's why people would go to studios sought after studios with tons of outboard gear because they had so much outboard gear you could use all these different processes on all the different tracks to really give it a unique sound so j j is for jaw harp and uh actually this i was going to just pull up an example i <laughs> think jaw harp so bizarre um so yes what is a jaw harp well if anyone watched the peanuts snoopy charlie brown and the peanuts you might recall um, that Snoopy often played in a couple of the various episodes this, it's also known as, now not to be confused with a mouth harp because that's usually a harmonica. A jaw harp is this little circular thing, almost kind of looks like a mushroom, a little thin piece of metal and you kind of place it between your teeth and then it has a, a bar that you twang and you go it kind of, that's what it sounds like a little more twangy though and uh you hear this a lot in a lot of world music you also hear it in some old blues and things and i actually have an example of this that i can play uh that i've recorded many times with this group called the jumping buddha so let me go ahead and open this up and i'll go into our there we go Look at that, remembered exactly where it was. Okay, so this is what a jaw harp sounds like, and it's this thing that you play in your mouth in, with, with your jaw. And you, the way that you get those kind of variations of the is you're, you're modifying the shape of your mouth. That was kind of breathing in and twanging this little bar, you know, and it creates these kind of neat sounds. Also, this is one of those fun things to kind of look at. It's, um, it just plays a single note. It just plays a tonic note. You can kind of see what that is right here. Which is approximately 400 hertz, which is just south of A, right? So normally we reference a440, you can see it here. All right, and we're at approximately 400, give or, give or take, give or take 20. So technically this is, uh, this is more like a, a G, somewhere between G and G sharp. It's probably meant to be a G, um, but you know, a lot of these things aren't exactly tempered. So uh, this is in fact, it looks like a G4, okay? So that is a jaw harp. Don't have a picture for one, you can Google that. Very nice to record, very nice sound. Again, it's got a lot of high end. Nothing below, you can see here, nothing at all uh, below 220 hertz. And ultimately, um, this is really something that's going to add a little bit of color 
in the upper range, in the upper registers. So um, it's kind of nice sometimes as a background element, especially if you're using something that has a drone. You know, these can be kind of nice. K, H-I-J, also for Jace, thank you. I should have put that in there. You would have you you thought I would have done that as a narcissist. Um, K, for kick, as in punch or a drum. So again, kick is a term, you know, let's kick it in, kick it. That also means other things. Um, but when we're in the studio recording music, kick is often referred to as like that, mm, just kick it, kick, kick and stick. It means you want to play the drums super loud, super tight. It also, of course, refers to the actual kick drum. So kick drum or bass drum. Uh, just take a listen here. Again, here's our, here's our blues bit. There's our kick drum with the snare drum in place in there. That's with our nice vulgar kick, right? There it is without the I am pusher. Okay. K for kick drum. Very important. Again, this is another one of those things when you look at the frequency display up here. All right. Kind of see where the fundamental of that kick, it's kind of got it, you know, it's got some resonance down below. Um, kind of looks like the fundamentals right around 90 to 100 hertz. So this this kick is a little bit higher. Oftentimes you'll see kind of that initial fundamental of a kick around 63 to 73 hertz. It's different for each one, different, uh, depends on how they were mic'd, what mic was used, if they're open, uh, if there's a head on the outside, if there is, if, uh, if, or if it's closed, or if there's a cutout, this can all affect the sound of the kick. But um, this is a real fundamental part of music mixing. And you always want to leave space, enough space to let that kick really kick to punch through, right? And leave other, and this is where equalization comes in as well, so that you're carving out space for things like bass, which also occupy those same frequencies. L for loudness. Okay, here we go. So loudness, this is kind of the uh, one of the many things that uh, I've brought brought to light many, many times um, when uh, when we've been talking about audio here and audio 101. And uh, it's all today, everything is about loudness. It's not just about peak amplitude. Um, it's not about sort of the, the former DBFS scale, decibels relative to full scale, it's now measured in this new scale, loudness units. And um, it's basically the way that we perceive everything. Uh, and if you take a look, actually this track, which is from this album called The Jumping Buddha, now this came out, gosh, 1998. Wow, it's a long time ago. So now this is mastered, but if you take a look here, it's, it's really quite something because um, you'll notice that the peak amplitude is minus three. That's almost that's almost unheard of by today. Well, it is unheard of by today's standards. I I I would be very shocked to see an album produced today in 2016 that has a peak below minus you know but a few decibels, a few a few tenths of a decibel below zero. So this was a bit more. This was sort of back in the, you know, let the audio breathe days before the loudness wars. However, when you look at the maximum RMS at around minus six, this is actually quite legit and this is not uncommon. So again, a lot of the mixing and sort of careful things that were done here, the perception is that it's really, it's going to still sound as loud, just not all the time. There's a lot of breathing room, right? This section. is going to sound dynamic and louder than this section, right, by design. And when you actually take a look at the loudness units here, measured minus 13.92, that's a bit conservative again for today. Most of today's music you're gonna see somewhere around minus eight, minus six, uh, it just kind of depends. But once again, this is where the amplitude statistics panel can be very, very useful to you if you're delivering your audio um, for broadcast, for the web, for iTunes and Spotify, because this is going to give you all of the loudness measurements, the current ITUR BS1770-3 broadcast standard for here in the US. We also measure an EBU, which you can also um, meter using our loudness radar meter, which we license from TC Electronic. You'll find this in Premiere Pro as well. So if you wanted to live monitor, say, based on the EBU, 
uh, LUFS standard, you can do that here. And then we also give you all of the RMS averages. Again, when we were measuring things in DBFS for output before, we were concerned with the RMS, root mean squared. These are all a series of averages. So the total average loudness amplitude, the maximum average loudness, the minimum average, and we're seeing, you can see we're using about 80 dB of dynamic range approximately here, and then the average, and then the bit depth, etc. So loudness, very important, something that we're uh, we've talked a lot about here. Also remember that if you use or want to match the actual loudness, the, the way that we perceive things, we have a panel in Audition called Match Loudness, which will do all the work for you behind the scenes. M, modulation, multiband, mastering, metadata. So modulation, we covered these. What do modulation type effects relate to in a DAW, chorus, flange, phase? These are all modulation-based effects. You can find them in the modulation effects panel here under the effects menu in Audition. Um, mastering, of course, the process of finishing your mix, which tends to involve applying things like compression, limiting, and EQ. And we covered a bunch of that. But again, mastering involves the finishing process of your mix. After everything is mixed, you then master. What else did I say we have here? Um, multiband. Yes. So that refers to multiband compression and or limiting. Again, in most of your DAWs, you'll have some kind of multiband compressor limiter. In the case of this one here, this is a four-band multiband compressor limiter, and it allows us to control each individual band with user-definable crossovers, meaning that I can control just the low frequencies, 0 to 137. I then have independent compression and limiting control over the low mids, 130 to 1100 hertz, and then the mids and the high mids, 1100 to 69, uh, 6900 hertz, and then the highs, 6900 to, in this case, 24K. Lots of different presets here. Multiband compression limiting is a fundamental standard of most mastering processes, right? You want to be able to control the bass frequencies a little bit differently with compression than you control the mid-range or high frequencies. So that's what you can get with a multiband compressor. Now this mix is already mastered, but if I just go ahead and turn this on and run it through here for a second. So here it is without our multiband compressor. All right? You can see how this compressor is now affecting uh, the bass frequencies here. Now, if I really wanted these to kind of slam, all right, we could increase. Let's increase our attack a little bit here. Just give it a little more punch. So here it is without. It's just kind of loose and flubby. All right, now it's tighter. Remember, we have to exceed that minus 12 level on our gain reduction meter here because we have our ratio set to 12.1. As we increase the attack, it's going to allow a little bit more of that initial attack to come through, but we don't want to make this too long, otherwise we're just going to make it, it's just going to sound kind of loose. And again, I've got a longer release so that it kind of compresses and then keeps everything down. So multiband compression. Now you can really hear the slap and the attack of that. Multiband, common in mastering, common in mixing, something that you should absolutely check out. And then the last thing, of course, was metadata. And this you can find in the metadata panel here. This is essential for um, deploying your content actually anywhere. Much like you add keywords and tags to your images, which stay with those images no matter where you publish them, the same goes for your metadata. In this case, these are ID3 tags. You'll also notice Broadcast Wave, IXML, Riff and Cart, and XMP. And this is all the metadata related to this particular file here. And you can see this is actually coming from, you know, this was. Uh, this is the, the, the purchase file from iTunes, so you're seeing the metadata that was listed in there. N for normalize. Okay, this one I used the American spelling on that. So normalize, normalization. Uh, one of the, what is this? 
Oh, base course. One of the, uh, again, most commonly encountered processes in audio editing, normalize, unlike compression and limiting, does not affect dynamics whatsoever. You're essentially taking an audio file as it is and either boosting or cutting everything, amplifying or de-amplifying everything by the same amount. That's it. So if I wanted to take this bass recording, which right now it peaks at minus seven, and I wanna make everything globally louder. We'll go into normalize and I can say, okay, just bring everything up. Right now it's at minus seven. Bring everything up to minus three, click apply, and it applies whatever boost was necessary there to make everything go to minus three. It didn't squash anything down. It didn't affect any of the attack transients. It just made everything a little bit louder globally. Similarly, if you wanted to normalize down, I could say, okay, normalize everything to minus 12 or to minus six. This is common when you have mastered everything and you need to deliver, um, this is a little bit old school, but when you need to deliver to a broadcaster, a lot of broadcasters would have you know peak levels of minus six. So you might say, okay, you know what? Everything here needs to be minus six or in this, or minus 12. So you could say apply, and then it does just that. It just globally adjusts the amplitude so that the loudest peak is minus 12. And that's what differentiates normalization from compression and limiting. Normalization scans and looks at the loudest peak in a file, the absolute loudest moment. And based on that loudest moment, which in this base file is minus 7.27, you can say, okay, I can normalize up 7.27 decibels to zero or I can normalize down to any level that I want. O for open. I got kind of lame there. I couldn't really think of a very good O, but file open is a very essential part <laughs> of your audio. I couldn't think of an O. What, 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 what else? Ocarina. I could have used that, I guess. Ocarina is a, um, uh, a flute type instrument more than sort of, well, they, they, you can have wood ocarinas, you can have stone ocarinas. Sounds kind of like a little piccolo flute. Um, file open to import your audio. You've also got file import, which you can use for file types, sessions, application settings, raw media, and other things. P, a lot of P's. P for plosive, pop filter, pitch correction, and parametric. Okay, plosive and pop filter go together. These are the popping P's that I've referred to many, many times. And again, to remove popping P's or plosives, I highly recommend using the FFT filter, which I showed you before. And if you select the option to kill the mic rumble, it will do just that. You wanna just select the popping P and get it out. Pitch correction, talked about this too. Uh, we have a native pitch correction effect inside Audition. Many know pitch correction from the famous auto-tune process by Antares, still around, still used all the time. Wah, 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 wah. Wah, 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 wah. You can see how it's just adjusting a little up or down in sense. You can set the scale. If you know the key, you can actually set the actual key. Works the same way. Attack, sensitivity, FFT size, the number of slices that it uses to analyze and make those changes, and then you can calibrate it to whatever you consider your A4. Remember, I was talking about that just a few moments ago. So, pitch correction. What was the last one? Parametric, okay, yes. And parametric EQ, one more form of equalization. Yet another, we've seen FFT. I mentioned G for graphic. This is the parametric, which gives you a lot more control. Parametric is going to be what, you're, what you will use for very precise clinical refinement of your frequencies. The native parametric equalizer in Audition is very nice because it actually is what's known as a five band parametric. One, two, three, four, five. Each with user definable frequencies. It also has what's known as a low shelving filter and a high shelving filter. And it has high pass filtering and low pass filtering. So this one is very full featured, very nice sounding. Do I use it on everything? No, I vary the different types of parametric EQ because again, each different parametric will have its own particular color. Now, I should have just stayed in that dialogue because Q is for Q or Q factor, also known as bandwidth or referred to as bandwidth. So let's go back to our parametric here. 
All right. When you are performing equalization on a track, you're going to make your adjustments in a parametric equalizer with the Q value, the Q factor or width. So if I wanted to boost, let's say 800 hertz here, I'm not going to play this back. I'm just going to show you this. This is more of a theoretical look at this right now. The Q value, the Q factor is how wide, how many subsequent frequencies, adjacent frequencies you're affecting by boosting. Now, larger Q values, excuse me, smaller Q values are going to sound a little bit more musical, um, but they're going to affect a lot of the frequencies to the left and right. As you increase the Q value, you are narrowing the bandwidth. So now we're affecting fewer frequencies. And this is what you would do if you were trying to, again, remove like a hum or a buzz or a very particular sort of annoying sound. And you can see you can get super, super narrow with these, right? Now, these are less musical, but they're meant to be more clinical. A buzz, um, a ring, and a snare drum. And this also allows you to isolate it and really uh, sweep through the frequencies to find where that is. R for restoration. So, R for restoration, I bring this up because obviously in Audition we have a whole series of restoration effects, noise reduction, sound removal, adaptive noise reduction, automatic click removing, automatic phase correction, click pop elimination, dehumming, and hiss reduction. So, R for restoration, lots of restora native restoration tools in Adobe Audition CC, and uh, I use them all the time. And I don't actually use any plugins. All the noise reduction stuff that I do, I do natively. I've tried RX, I've tried some of the others. I ultimately go back to auditions. S, stereo surround, spectral display, SSL. Well, spectral display, we're looking at it. This is known as frequency over time. We've got frequency along our vertical axes here, axis, the y-axis, time along the x horizontal, and as I mentioned, color is amplitude. The closer the color is to yellow, the louder the amplitude at that particular frequency. The closer the color is to black, the quieter the amplitude at that particular frequency. SSL plugins, I've shown these many, many times. These are among some of my favorites. It's a third-party plugin. You can get these through Waves. And uh, these are just brilliant. And these are, you know, full audio recreations of classic analog, in this case, a classic analog mixing console and channel strip, including its parametric EQ. Okay, and again, here's your Q value. This one, it's not even indicated via a, a term. You can just see it's showing you. Here's very narrow, here's very wide, okay? And you can see numerically, right, 3 and 0.5. And as I mentioned, the lower the number, the wider the bandwidth, the higher the number, the tighter the bandwidth, okay, or the more narrow. SSL plugins, SSL compression, these are some of my favorites. They're used on basically every recording that I make. Stereo and surround. So again, when we're working in Audition, you've got three basic methods, mono, stereo, or surround. Surround sound, we are a full-featured 5.1 multi-channel uh, mixing environment. So if you are going to be doing something in surround, I don't. Have, this is not a surround session, but we do have our native track panner, and you've seen in uh, a previous 101 how you can automate and control all of your audio in surround space in Audition. And again, when you're creating your multi-tracks, you have the option here of working in either mono, which would be single channel, stereo, which is dual channel, or 5.1, which is six channels, right? With discrete left front, right front, left surround, right surround, LFE or sub, and center, okay? So mono, stereo, or 5.1, and those are the, the three operating methods or mixing methods that you have uh, the ability to use in Audition and in most of your DAWs. Some will do 7.1 as well, but all will do mono and stereo. Okay, T for time. Time pitch stretch effects. So these, again, common things that we use in audio production. Uh, I had to use quite a bit of these myself yesterday for a project that I was doing some music and sound design on. Now, I can't show you the video. I can actually let you hear a little bit of this. So this is an underwater piece. I composed and did all the sound design for this. And I talk about T for time-based effects because often 
when you're doing sound design, uh, you have to do a bit of stretching and manipulation. And if you take a look down below here, here I'm just going to scroll up and then zoom in. You can see if I just solo one of these. So I've got some liquid water effects here and I'm stretching them 125%. Now we've got lots of different options and you'll have different options in all of your different DAWs of what you can do to adjust time and pitch. Often these two go in tandem. However, uh, they can also be independent. So if you're in a basic, and this is something, and I use T as time because this applies to everything when you're stretching or affecting the duration or length of your audio. Um, when you're working in a monophonic or polyphonic environment, again, you've got complete control over do you want to affect pitch and adjust the duration, one or the other, or both. You can do both simultaneously. So you can speed it up, but actually lower the pitch. This would not normally be how a classic time stretch algorithm works. This is new. This is new as of the last 16 years or so that you can adjust time and pitch independently. However, if you want to sort of uh, emulate a classic tape-based time adjustment, right? So if you slow the tape down, what happens to the pitch? It automatically goes lower. If you speed the tape up, the pitch automatically goes faster. That's known as vary speed. So that's a time-based correction using vary speed. And we also have mono and polyphonic, which allows you independent control over time, duration, and pitch. You for undo non-destructive. You might say, hey, you undo, that's like a cop-out, man. No, because it actually refers to two different working methods in virtually all of your audio editing applications. So when you're in the waveform view here and you make a change, let's say that I delete this. I'm just going to say, okay. That is a destructive cut. Now, nothing will happen until I actually file save that. But in order for me to come back to this later, with that change applied, I have to save it. So it's destructive. Now I still have the ability, of course, to undo, meaning that this is technically also non-destructive, but only before you save, right? So the waveform view is has undo, but it's still technically a destructive environment. Whereas the multitrack, I can do the same thing here. And let's say that I made a, a time selection like this, right click, split, and let's just go ahead and, and like cut this out and move these pieces together. That's non-destructive. I don't have to undo that per se. I can undo it. I can undo the move and I can undo the cut. But because we're working in a non-destructive environment by nature here in the multi-track, the audio that I just cut out, it's, always, it's already there. It's always there. So you have undoable options in both the multi-track and the waveform view, but the waveform view is by design a destructive undo based editor and the multi-track is a totally non-destructive with undo based editor. V for voiceover vocals and video. We've done a lot of this. In fact, last week's, not last Monday's, but a week ago Friday, the um, Audio 101 Part 17 was on podcast, voiceover and voice recording. Obviously an essential part uh, of all uh, mixing, whether for video or, you know, for music and many things, lots of different ways to treat voiceover and voices. Um, again, here I've got some voice. Fa wants to resolve to me. The four wants to resolve to the three. Okay. So this is from, again, my Just Play Music show talking. This is in the blues episode and I'm just narrating here. Uh, oh, I'm playing piano behind it as well. Uh, me, 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 me. Okay, so um, this is an, ac an excellent application to produce voiceover. Uh, talked a lot about using different favorites and presets to compress EQ and hard limit your voice. And uh, video, of course, is also supported here. So here I can just show you a very, very brief second of this. There you go. So um, there is video that accompanies the audio sound design that you're seeing here. All right. And uh, we fully support anything that's coming from Premiere Pro as well. So you can dynamically link footage from Premiere, timelines from Premiere into Audition, regardless of whether they're 2K, 4K, 8K, Red Media, Airy Media, 360 Media, 
Anything that you've got in Premiere, you can dynamically link into Audition. You can also bring rendered video. That's actually what this is. This is an actual rendered reference MP4. This one is not um, a dynamically linked video. You can see it right here. So uh, full video support. And now the ability to export your audio back with video as well. So you don't even have to finish it on the Premiere side. You can finish it in Audition, export back to video and be done. W, window method in frequency analysis. Okay, we're at the end here. So this is something that I show a lot. Um, I'm always referencing the frequency analysis here. And uh, if I just here, let me bring this down. I'm gonna play this back. So you'll see here, it's uh, working a little slowly on this track. Um, we have our frequency analysis panel, and if you twirl down advanced, you'll see that you have windowing functions, okay? Now the window function basically determines the FFT sort of shape uh, of the, the lines or the area or the bars, and by that I mean the shape in terms of how narrow or how wide it represents the center frequency. I typically keep this in either Triangular or Blackman-Harris, which is kind of a, a best of both worlds. And I generally like to use a minimum of 2048 FFT. Remember the FFT in the case of this is the number of frequency slices. Fewer FFTs might give you better performance, but you're going to see less detail overall in general. So it's not as inherently useful. Um, anywhere from 1024 to 2048 is sort of my recommended best practice for these. And again, you've got lines, area, and bars. This can also go full screen as we decided, which, uh, as I showed you moments ago. Okay. So it's just another great way to kind of dynamically view and visualize what the audio is doing. X axis and spectral display. Again, that refers to the time, your uh, horizontal axis here, X for your time. Y, X, Y, Z, so Y is your, uh, your vertical that contains all of your frequencies. Also along the Y axis and spectral frequency, you can go between hertz and actual note values. Remember that frequencies directly relate to actual note values on the tempered scale. And lastly, X, Y, Z for zoom. Now you might think that's kind of lame in editing gestures and mouse wheel, but this is something I talk about all the time specifically with regard to this application, using gestures and or a wheel to zoom in and out, all the way down to sample level, and all the way back out very quickly, just by doing this, okay? It's super accurate, it's super fast. I can't emphasize enough. This is why I've never moved permanently from Audition, previously Cool Edit, in over 16 years there is still no editor that does this quite as fluidly. That might be IMHO, but it's also kind of the fact, Jack. We just, editing, speed, accuracy, zoom ability, super awesome in this application. Um, I mean, everybody does it, but we just, we just do it a little bit better. So zoom and zoom factor inside of Audition CC, so good, so accurate and a really essential part of audio editing. And my friends, we went a little bit over, but I'll edit this for YouTube, so we should get this right down to about an hour. That is Audio 101 A to Z, terms, terminology, and tips you need to know. And that's really, that covers kind of everything that we've done here over the last 20 episodes, right? Compression, limiting, voiceover, recording, multi-tracking, bass, multi-band compression, zooming, windowing functions, frequency analysis, levels, gain, delay-based effects, reverb, flange, phase, modulation. <sighs> it's all there. All right, so thank you so much for watching Audio 101, episode 18. This has been such a great series. Hope you've enjoyed it. I've enjoyed doing it for you. Stick around for more in the future. We'll see you next time.